All right. Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. Uh, I have Brother Cripps with me tonight, as usual, and Sister Renee is on her way. She, she says she's running about five or six minutes late now, so she'll be joining us any minute. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody in the chat room right now. Uh, hi, Stephanie and Hendrix, Celine. Ty Locks, uh, I, I don't know who you are. If you're new here, welcome. Uh, and Switch and Frank. So welcome to everybody, and uh, I'm looking forward to this study tonight. Uh, if you're not uh, up to date, we are uh, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, uh, verse uh, 8 tonight is where we're starting off. We, uh, I hope that everybody will, uh, if you haven't we'll followed this study from the beginning, go back and watch it from uh, the very beginning, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, and get caught up. But... Uh, Brother Cripps, uh, before we get into the scriptures, say hi to everybody, will you? I'll be glad to, thank you. Hello to everyone in the chat, Switch321, see you, Hendrix, everybody. Welcome, Celine, all, uh, Stephanie. Um, glad to be here again for another awesome Bible study. These are uh, so um, uh, edifying to me personally. I'm glad to be a part of it, and thanks for letting me be on the panel. I really appreciate it. And uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name's Jason Cripps, and I'm part of a channel called True Story Live. We come on Sundays at 9 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time, and um, also on uh, Talking Doctrine with uh, Matthias uh, for Monday's Milk, Matthias and Daryl. We have uh, guest hosts come in there uh, every week, and uh, also um, enjoy the Friday Fellowship, also on Sin City Preacher on Fridays. I'm happy to be here and looking forward to another good Bible study tonight. Okay, thank you, brother. Uh, we are on 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 8, uh, but uh, to give a little context, uh, we, we only covered seven verses uh, in this chapter, so I'm going to start from verse 1 just to read to, get, to give us the context, and then we'll start discussing it with beginning with verse 8. So in the KJV, uh, 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. As Concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. For though there be uh, that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Mm. Howbeit, uh, there is not in every man that knowledge, for some with conscience of the idol unto the, this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Mm. And the verse we're going to begin with tonight is in 8. It says, but meat commendeth us not to God. For neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. Mm. Okay, so Brother Cripps, uh, can you expound on that for us? Yeah, I absolutely can. And I, I, I'll just uh, back up a little bit for verse 7. And, and uh, I, I think this is an awesome verse to understand. Um, so it's, it's saying that if you're focused on this idea of eating uh, meat that's sacrificed to idols and you're, you eat it anyway, um, uh, your conscience being weak is defiled. So by the very act of you doing that, uh, it, it, it does the defiling. Um, if you are in good conscience eating something that formerly had been sacrificed to idols and you understand uh, that that uh, the, the being sacrificed to idols means nothing. Your focus is on the right thing. 
uh, which is Jesus Christ. He mentions in verse six, he, he's back to that again, which I appreciate. And then so he backs it up with verse eight, which uh, I was going to jokingly say this is a good verse for the vegans to uh, to look at because the, the bottom line is whether you eat meat or don't eat meat, um, you, it doesn't bring you closer to God. It doesn't keep you further away from God. Neither one of those things. Uh, but he commendeth us not to God. That's, that's uh, I'm sure in the Amplified, it's going to clean that up a little bit. Um, but it just means that, um, you know, it doesn't do anything for you or against you. It doesn't bring you closer to God by whether you decide to eat meat uh, that was formerly uh, given to idols or not. Yeah, exactly right. I, I think the, uh, the idea of uh, it actually being helpful to someone in some way where he says uh, um, meat commendeth us not to God neither if we eat are we the better mm -hmm. um, now he's, he's saying that because I believe he's responding to the viewpoint that, uh, that some people are actually think and that if they do this they're better off somehow spiritually yes. I, I imagine I don't yes. think this is a matter of nutrition and good health I would agree. This is, this is eating meat uh, or, or not eating the meat based upon the spiritual uh, mm -hmm. ramifications here. Absolutely. Uh, but so some people apparently are, are thinking that um, uh, they should be religious about this. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's saying that whichever way you, you do this has no benefit one way or the other. Right. Uh, so, so let me read 7 and 8 in the Amplified. Awesome. Hey, guys. Hey, oh, Renee. Sister. Hi, sister. Yeah, we've only uh, be just begun. Uh, I'm sure everybody in the chat room is, is happy. To, I told them you're running a couple minutes late. You want to say hi to everybody, sister? Yeah. Uh, hey, guys. Sorry about that. Wednesdays are a rush for me. Sometimes I'm a few minutes late. But we're uh, still into seven or gone into eight now. We're on uh, eight, verse eight. And we're going to verse 7 and 8 right now. Okay. And I'm going to read it in the Amplified. Okay. Uh, and then I'll, let, you know, I'll get your thoughts on it. Um, right. Rick, um, Renee, you'll be happy to know that Brother Luke started the first verse just to put it in context. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Brother Renee's, Renee's a good influence on us, isn't she? Always insisting on context. She is a good influence. There's no doubt about that. I don't care what anyone awesome. says about her. <laughs> okay. All right. So in the Amplified, in verse 7 and 8, it says, However, not all believers have this knowledge, but some, being accustomed uh, throughout their lives to thinking of the idol unto, until now as real and living, still eat food as it, if it were a sacrifice to an idol. And because their conscience is weak, it is defiled. Uh, uh, guilty or shamed mm. but uh, now food will not commend us to God nor bring us close to him mm. we are no worse off if we do not eat nor are we better if we do eat okay Renee boom Putting you I'm throwing you right into the deep end Renee. yeah Knock yeah I'm having I think I have an old uh uh, search engine that's having a hard time. So if I'm a couple seconds in responding, it's because my thing is lagging. Okay. Uh, so I'm trying, I've been trying to fix this, but I'm having some issues. But um, yeah, this whole thing is about people trying to be, uh, to, to be justified or be righteous through carnal observances. Mm. And one of these is the food uh laws that israel had uh in addition to that it's uh what about like the romans who offer their uh food if you go to dinner at a roman or a greek's house they may uh offer or bless their food in the name of their household idol uh what do we do if we're invited over we don't want to offend someone in their own home because yeah. hospitality was a big deal back then Sure. There were all kinds of horror stories about what the gods would do to you if you offended or didn't you failed to protect someone in your home. And you can see a lot, uh, even offering his own virgin daughters to rapists so as not to offend the house guests. Yeah. Uh, so there, uh, there was a lot of that going on, I'm sure. 
But Paul is trying to remind people that, uh, and again, I want to remind everybody, last week I mentioned how Paul is not saying that there isn't a demonic spirit behind idolatry, because there is. He yeah. says when you make a sacrifice to an idol, you sacrifice to devils. So there were literal evil spirits that were associated with these things. Make no mistake about it. But the power itself, there's only one power, one God, and that is uh, our Father in Heaven. Amen. So uh, what what they're saying is the idol itself has no power, so don't fear eating it. Because as long as you uh, receive it with thanksgiving, know who the true God is, and give him glory for it, and, you know, I, I, my, I myself, I don't eat unblessed food. I pray over everything. Yeah. And I tell people, you can eat something unblessed if you want to. Yeah. But I, uh, I believe in, in thanking God for that. And he says that you, you can't be justified. I believe a lot of this also came from legalism where the Jews still thought they had to keep uh, the food observances, yeah. eating certain things. Like, uh, but he's trying to remind them that carnally, us in our flesh, we can't we can't please God in our flesh. Right. There's nothing we can do in our flesh here. So, um, this specific verse seems to me. Let me get to the actual uh, verse here, and that's uh, seven and eight, or just eight. Uh, eight. Eight's where we start. Okay. Because we we know that. You don't do anything against your own conscience because whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So if you think you're going to offend God or you're sinning by eating meat off to an idol, you should not do it because now you're doing something not of faith. Right. Because it says their conscience weak is defiled, but meat commendeth not to God. So again, you can't be reconciled to God nor please God through carnal things like observing which meats to eat and which ones not to eat. Right. Uh, because God is spirit and we worship him in spirit and in truth, mm. not in carnal observances. Um, but me commend us not to God for neither if we eat, are we the better? Neither if we eat not, are we the worst? So mm. either way, if you choose, if your conscience says, hey, I feel like I will offend God if I eat this, right. then don't eat it. If you feel like you won't offend God, then by all means, eat it, because either way, it's good. Uh, but to do something against your conscience, that's where it's bad. So he's just saying the, the observances of carnal things like which meats to eat, not to eat, none of that uh, has anything to do with your relationship with God. But what does affect it? is if you do something not of faith. Right. Uh, so I, I think he's really pointing out that these are of the flesh yeah. and that there's no power of, of God. So you don't have to fear anything offered to an idol. Uh, you receive it with thanksgiving. Give, give God the thanks for it. Uh, he is the God. You don't have to worry about it. But yeah. again, don't do anything against your own conscience. Yeah. It's only sin. That's why it says, blessed is the man who does not condemn that which he allows. Yes. If you allow it, don't get condemned over it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Victoria Sarton uh, pointed out in the in the chat that it reminds her, that these verses remind her of the Hebrew rooters, and it definitely oh, does yeah. as well. Oh, yeah, and the Muslims. They observe yeah. those don't eat pork things, too. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. But it particularly toward the Hebrew rooters. Oh, yeah. They're, they're trying, yeah, they're trying they're to say, don't they say that, Jason? Don't they say that we are still under the food observances? Yeah. And yeah. that the Torah must be kept. I'd like to see them, like Michael LeRae points out, you know, that they have a law that if a, a, a tree has that, a tree has to be in a certain proximity of your home and it has to have bared fruit for at least X amount yep. of years or you're not allowed to eat from it. Are they keeping that one too? Uh, I don't think they are. I don't think they're they're really keeping any of them. They may think law buffet, law buffet again. Yeah, I believe so. Easy legalism, brother Luke. Yeah, you're muted, brother Luke. You're muted. 
Okay, thank you. There you go. Yes, sir. So, selective application of the law. Uh, but I think what, um, on one hand, Paul is saying that it's okay either way. Yeah. If you decide you don't want to eat this, it's okay. Yeah. You're, 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 but you're not any better off one way or the other. Right. But he is also actually saying, if you really want to understand this spiritually the right way, is is that it really has no power. You need to understand that it's perfectly okay to eat it. You, uh, you, if you think that there's a problem and you have to avoid it, you really don't get it. But if that's what you think, then then go ahead and avoid it. Um, but I'm going to read it in the um, uh, NABRE, verse 7 and 8. And we got a couple of footnotes I want to look at too. But the interesting thing is, uh, you know, some Bible translations, um, they uh, have inserted uh, titles and subtitles uh, throughout chapters. Mm -hmm. And I notice here there's a subtitle beginning with verse 7, and it, it's titled Practical Rules. Hmm. And I remember Renee talking last week about the begin the first few verses in this. This is the practical part yeah. that Paul's talking about now. So here in the in the NABRE, verse seven and eight, it says, But not all have this knowledge. There are some who have been so used to idolatry up until now that when they eat meat sacrificed to idols, their conscience, which is weak, is defiled. Now <coughs> Food will not bring us closer to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, nor are we better off if we do. So I think that expresses it exactly right, and, and uh, it's very clear. Uh, let's go to the, the Amplified footnote first uh, for verse uh, 7. Um, it says, 1 Corinthians 8, verse 7, in Paul's viewpoint, meat sold at the marketplace even if it had been used in idol worship was permissible food because a pagan sacrifice was meaningless right and the meat itself could not be contaminated by any such ritual some who had accepted christ worried that, that they were violating their new faith if they ate any meat without knowing its origin firsthand mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, I think the footnote uh, is uh, is valid, making a valid point. Uh, I do object to this, uh, and I, I think we all are, are a little bit sensitive to the ideas of uh, accepting Jesus. Uh, I mean, you know, when when we when we um, become Christians, it's because we believe in Jesus, we believe on Him, we believe yeah. His uh, in, in His uh, p person and promises and yeah. accomplishments for us. Uh, it's not the fact that we are accepting Him. I've accepted Jesus. But so when I see things like uh, the, uh, some who had accepted Christ, I don't yeah. like that expression. It gives people the wrong idea that you get saved by somehow accepting Christ. Mm -hmm. um, uh, okay, well, well, I'll read the footnote on the uh, NABRE now uh, in verse, uh, for verse uh, 8 and 9, it says, Although the food in itself is morally neutral, extrinsic circumstances may make the eating of it harmful, a stumbling block. The image is that of tripping or causing someone to fall. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is a basic moral imperative for Paul, a counterpart to the positive imperative to, quote, build one another up, unquote. Compare the expression of, quote, giving offense, unquote, as opposed to pleasing in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Um, all right, I, I think the footnote in the, in the Amplified is uh, very... Uh, helpful but what do you, do you am i you think i'm overreacting when i say when i respond the way i did about those people who accepted christ <laughs> am i am i just splitting hairs no here? You, no i do the same thing i it's possible isn't uh just accepting in a way it is because you're receiving what he's offering yeah. But I, I don't like it when they go, I accepted Christ, because again, it puts them in the driver's seat yeah. in some way. Uh, yeah. And it also makes it, yeah. it's a difficult thing, but I'm with you on that. I understand that. But technically, you, you do accept him. You're 
receiving God through his son. So you could say it, but I get what your connotation is also. Yeah, there's just so many um, expressions. Not that, biblical. You won't find them in the Bible. Yeah. Like I invited him into my heart. Yeah, submit or, your or, life. Or, or or I gave my life to Jesus. Right. Or or uh, I made him my Lord. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know all all these ways that people try to express this this um, event. It's an event being. And the one here. thing they did, the Bible does say to do, they mock, believe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that interesting? The Isn't one interesting? way to salvation that is clear and constant yeah. is to believe believe in believe on and what do they yeah. do mock it yeah they do mock it you're right mm -hmm. you're right because they want it to be something that they're doing they do they want it to be they want yeah. they want to have some stock yep. in saving their own soul and they'll listen and and they hear these terms like luke's talking about and they've heard it so much they don't even realize it's unbiblical yeah. so they'll fight for man's tradition yeah. over biblical faith any day yeah they, they they will and do yeah um well i whenever i see things like that it immediately is uh, alarming to me uh, i feel like you need to correct it and i hope i hope all of us will start to identify this this terminology that has been developing at least in america in my lifetime the, the way that people are expressing this identity as a christian and and, and with it, the way that they're expressing it it makes me think do they really understand the gospel at all mm -hmm. uh, all right let's go back to the kjv and and read verse uh, nine uh, but take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to them that are weak mm. renee i'll ask you to go first on verse nine <clears throat> Sorry, it takes me a second to click all around this stuff. Let me um, read it here. But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours becomes, we, we discussed this in another verse, because you feel free in what you can eat and you're not under bondage. Someone weak in the faith meaning they still think they can please God through keeping carnal ordinances and food laws. Mm -hmm. If you observe your freedom and they feel they're still trying to do some legalistic thing to stay with God, yeah. it's better that you don't eat the meat to help them feel more comfortable because them being offended and getting a grudge against you is a worse sin than them not understanding the liberty they do have. Amen. So we don't want our freedom to become a stumbling block of offense. Whenever it says stumbling block, it means something that a person will be offended or fall over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we don't want that to be something that offends another brother. It's okay to say, you understand, we don't please God with these things. We're not, uh, it doesn't matter. We can't do that. But if you are more comfortable, I am willing to observe it to keep you comfortable. I do that with my Jewish friends. Mm. Just, I don't order things that offend them. Most of the time, <laughs> it doesn't really offend them. Right. But if it does, I'm, I make certain and let them know, if seafood offends you, I will not order it. Right. You know, so and, and that speaks very loudly to people. It's just about not you having freedom to eat whatever you want is not worth offending someone over. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Brother Cripps, I, um, you heard what Renee said mm -hmm. and you, you, you get the point that she made. But what about a person that will say, well, they should just get over it. It's, it's ridiculous. They just don't understand that it, it's meaningless. It, you know, uh, we're all free to eat this, so just get over it. Yeah. Versus versus Renee's approach, what, uh, what would you say? Um, I would say that, well, they have the wrong attitude. I mean, I would say that they're projecting their, um, their insolence. I think that's the right word, their insolence on others. They're, they're indignant about that because they don't, they don't want to give up whatever, whatever it is. Let's say it's eating meat. So um, if, uh, 
and this is all deja vu a little bit because we've we've covered this very topic before the three of us we've covered it um and again the reason why paul's going over it again is because it's still a problem and it's still a problem today and 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 God knew, I believe God knew it would still be a problem with, with uh, Hebrew rooters and trying to put people back under the law and other groups uh, as well. So, so the person that says, just get over it, listen to the attitude, just in the way it's said. Oh, just get over it. It's silly. I mean, it, it, it's ridiculous. I mean, um, Paul is, is saying that it is, it, he's not saying it's silly, but, no. but it, you could easily come to the conclusion that it really is silly. They just don't understand this. Matter of fact, that's how he starts out. He says um, in verse uh, seven, he says, uh, "Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge. Yeah. And in Amplify says, however, not all believers have this knowledge. Yeah, and then the NABRE says, "But not all have this knowledge, so not right. not, all, not all people get it, and they don't understand that they have this freedom, and they shouldn't it shouldn't be an issue." But uh, you can try to teach him and tell him and, and say, "Hey, just get over it. It's not it's not really an issue. You're free to do it." Or you can do as Renee and Paul are suggesting, for their sake, can't you just go without your your meat this time? To for, yeah. you know, uh, let me read it in the Amplified and, and Crips, uh, then you give me your feedback on that. Sure, sure. Verse 9 in the Amplified says, Only be careful that this liberty of yours, uh, this, this power to choose, does not somehow become a stumbling block, that is a temptation to sin, to the weak in conscience. Mm -hmm. I'll give you give you a real good example. I am not a vegan. I'm not, and and uh, in my past, I would kind of make fun of the real vigilant uh, vegans, and by that I mean the ones that aren't just satisfied with deciding to be a vegan themselves, but they wanna they wanna pull out the videos of the meat packing thing, the terrible cruelty to animals, and they want you to watch uh. it. And try to try to prove to you in some way that you should stop eating meat. Those are the ones that I'm referring to, but I used to be real kind of dogmatic about that and I'd call them out at every opportunity. Um, and, and I'm glad that I don't do that. That's a bad attitude, it really is. Uh, if someone wants to be a vegan and they, they decide for whatever reason, whether it's cruelty to animals or, or, or for dietary reasons, uh, whatever their reasons are, that's fine for them. So in that case, if I were inviting someone over to my house that I knew was a vegan, I would uh, serve vegan dishes. Um, now, I know that I'm at liberty to go ahead and eat a steak in front of them, but I know going into it that I could possibly offend them by that, and especially since I'm inviting to their house, uh, in, into my house. Um, and the same goes if I'm a guest at someone else's house. If I go over to someone else's house, let's say Renee invites... Uh, Jen and myself over for dinner and she's a vegan, which she isn't, but if she were, I wouldn't go in there and expecting her to throw some steaks on the grill. It wouldn't be an expectation in my mind. Um, I would uh, eat whatever she put in front of me and be delighted. If it was just a salad and vegetables and stuff like that, I would be delighted uh, to do that. And I don't want to be a stumbling block to anyone. And that's what Paul is saying is don't use the liberty that you're given. So he makes the point in verse seven, as Brother Luke pointed out, they don't have the knowledge. Not all believers have this knowledge that it's okay, that it doesn't matter if it was uh, sacrificed to idols in the past. We have liberty through Christ. Because of that, you can eat the meat now, no problem, where before you couldn't. Um, so it's an abolishment of the dietary laws as, as it, as it uh, relates to a believer. Um, so they don't have the knowledge. He could have said, uh, use the word ignorant. It's just ignorance. Ignorance isn't is the same as being foolish. Ignorance is just you're not aware. You're not aware of the liberty. You don't have the knowledge of something. And if you don't have the knowledge of something and you're holding on to it, uh, in other words, choosing not to eat meat for whatever reason, then we who have the knowledge, who have the liberty, um, as, as being stronger, uh, at least spiritually in this one area, we should be able to resist being a stumbling block. We can resist the meat for that meal for the purpose of not causing someone else to stumble or being an offense. Hey, Jason, mm -hmm. Hendricks made a nice point. He said, this is really a burden on the stronger brother to show love yeah. to another. You know, you never lose out 
on being loving and considerate. Mm. If more people would just go with that spiritual sense of if there's ever a question, get outside of yourself. Because when you demand you uh, you manifest your liberty in this situation, that isn't loving. That's self-centered. Yeah. That's I'm going to have it my way and prove that I'm no. If, if 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 you're never sure on something, always err on the side of love and compassion. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. and and that really is a burden upon others to show love. And we shouldn't have to be told that I'm going to tell you more people lean towards legalism and preaching at you than they do with grace. And that's because most of them haven't received grace. That's true. You know, they still think somehow they're pleasing God through their legalism and and rule keeping as opposed to the spirit of Christ. Right. You know, and they're not manifesting that spirit, even not in just food things, but in general. Mm-hmm. It's not, I mean, I hear people say the most horrible things. God's punishing you. They're already suffering. Those people are already suffering. How about let's lean to we should be more loving and selfless and compassionate than the world. Yeah. But I'm seeing that the world is, I mean, some of the things I told my atheist writing partner uh, that they people said to me, he said it, he was appalled by them. He was mm-hmm. an atheist. I can't believe, but see, they come from this I'm righteous attitude and they forget to be. And most of the time, I believe it's because they don't have the spirit of Christ in them. They think they know Jesus because they think they know what he wants by the Ten Commandments. Right. Instead of the true spirit of Christ, which is his grace and love and compassion. Yeah. Uh, You know, so he didn't come to condemn us, but to save us. And uh, they, they forget that. So if you're ever confused on what's the right thing to do, it's the legalistic rule laying down is never the right way to go. Mm. Never. That doesn't mean that if somebody has like, uh, because I know they're going to go directly to the homosexuality or the alcoholism. That's exactly where they're going to go when I say this. So we're just supposed to do do, do. So I already know where it's going. But yes, if someone is in overt sinful lifestyle, you need to give them the gospel and the message of God's grace and Mm -hmm. nothing else. That's all they need right now. You don't have to go laying down the way God says you ought to live. You don't have to do none of that. If somebody's unsaved and they're doing these things, it's not your job to to sanctify anybody, but to give them the real message of Jesus, which is his unconditional grace, forgiveness, and love. That's how we always lean. Always. While you were talking, Renee, just really quickly, I, I had this mental image of like someone uh, being involved in a prison ministry where you go in and you uh, preach the gospel to people that are they're literally behind bars and getting up, standing up and saying, hey, I'm free. You guys are in prison. I'm free. Look at the liberty I have. I, you know, you guys don't get to do anything. I, I can go anywhere I want. I can eat what I want. Right. Nobody would do that. That's the wrong oh. attitude. That's the attitude that people have when, uh, when, as Brother Luke was asking me the question, you know, um, it, you know, if someone says, "Yeah, yeah, that's ridiculous," or that's that, I, that's not the word to use, but he's 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 saying, um, "Yeah, just get over it, get over right. it." You're you're in prison, and I'm free. I have the liberty, so I'm I'm going to smear it in your face. That's and, and, and That's right. Oh my gosh, what a great way of putting it, Jason. Mm-hmm. Praise God. All right. Um, I want to, uh, in verse 9, uh, relate it to um, Hendrix's question and point. Hendrix, I did see it. It's just taken a while for me to, to get to it. But Hendrix wrote, uh, generally speaking, the word stumbling block is just another way of saying sitting, right? Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure I really understand the question, but I want to I answer it uh, thinking that maybe I understand what you mean. Uh, well, the stumbling block, uh, it, it's not talk, it's not really, um, if we create a stumbling block for somebody else, uh, then, uh, then they may be inclined to sin. 
because because uh, we we did we did this uh, whatever Paul's talking about here, whether it's um, alcohol, where he said we're going to have a drink in front of an alcoholic, or we're going to eat this food and when in uh, this circumstances uh, of these scriptures here, or, or anything else where we're refusing to give up our liberty. Uh, and um, saying, I'm free, so I'm going to do it anyway, without even considering that it may become a stumbling block for the, the, the brother or sister. Uh, so uh, how does this relate to sin? Is it is another way of saying sin? I don't really think it's another way of saying sin, but it's a question of, are we willing to love our brethren enough that we can make a little sacrifice? I mean, is it that important that we have to have a drink in front of the alcoholic? Come on, can't can't we make a little sacrifice and abstain from the drink or abstain from the meat or, or the uh, sacrifice right. to idols for for their sake? But if we look at the the word the footnotes again on the uh, the, the stumbling block, it it says uh, that it is um, uh, the image is that of tripping or causing someone to fall. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Like yeah. trip somebody up, but the Jews. Jesus was a stumbling block mm -hmm. it, yeah. because they couldn't get, they couldn't accept that he was the son of God. So they stumbled at that stumbling stone. Mm -hmm. He was an offense to them. Yeah. It offended mm -hmm. them. Yeah. And people, when they get offended, they can sin, but it doesn't always mean sin. It can mean that it causes their path to be messed up Good in point. some way. Good point. So, uh, to uh, directly, let's answer Hendrick's question. He says, is this stumbling block just another way of saying sin? I, I don't really, I wouldn't interpret it that way. As, no. as, if we are a stumbling block to someone else, what we're doing is uh, creating a situation that, that may cause them a problem, either, either for them to sin or, or to do something that is uh, not helpful or beneficial for them and we are not helping with the problem we're help we're we're contributing to the problem by being a stumbling block so are we sinning by being a stumbling block is the other person sinning because we made a, a stumbling block and they stumbled over it i don't know but i don't think we should interpret the term or the word stumbling block as uh sin uh, yeah. what do you say renee or crips yeah uh, i i agree a stumbling block can move towards sin. Like if I offend you, you might hold a grudge and now you got hate in your heart and that's murder. So yeah, that could be, or it could be something that, uh, uh, you know, like you said, causes you to trip up on your path, makes you want to drink again if you're an alcoholic. Or uh, in any case, like Jesus was a stumbling stone, a stumbling block to the Jews because they wanted to take the path of the law and he raised the bar of the law and salvation was offered only through him. So it was a stumbling block because they couldn't get over it. They couldn't uh, go the path that he had set before him. So they stumbled uh, at that and rejected him and remained on a wrong path uh, towards salvation. So technically it is sin, but you wouldn't say a stumbling block is sin itself. But if you're if you're defining sin as being missing the mark of God's perfection, then yeah, you could say that because uh, we should always uh, manifest Christ-like behavior. And He would have never, you know, uh, He would have always cared for what the other person needed more than His own. Uh, but you know, sin stumbling block does not automatically mean sin. Huh. Yeah, I, th I think uh, we all, you know, trip them up. I think that's just a good way. It's something that'll make somebody trip up. Yeah, and I'll add a quick story to that. Well, I'll never forget this. When I was a kid, the church I was going to, they did, they were doing a passion play, and my um, my uh, spiritual mentor, uh, he's my dad's uh, best friend there in the gospel group together, but uh, they got him to play Jesus in that. And he wasn't an actor. He's a great orator. He has a great bass, uh, low voice, great singer, but he's, he wasn't an actor. And during rehearsals, um, they wanted, the director wanted him to, when he was carrying the cross to the, to the stage uh, as Jesus is playing the role of Jesus, he wanted him to stumble at a certain point, but he, he, he wasn't able to do it 
uh, it didn't look right to the director. So they literally nailed a block of wood to the ground and had uh, Phil practice uh, kind of stumbling over that block of wood and it, it worked out fine. But the point of it is that block of wood itself isn't sin in, in this scenario that we're presenting. Um, it does provide for them an opportunity to sin. It's a stumbling block. Uh, so in this case, if we're doing these things, we're creating, we're, we're nailing a block of wood potentially to the ground and giving them an opportunity to stumble over the stumbling block. Yeah, so I would say that if you put that block of wood down there, that you, uh, I could say that you are sinning because you're per intentionally, willfully yes. creating, creating a stumbling block that may be a problem for someone else. Yes, that and would be said. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, uh, Sister Renee, I think you have to answer Richard Arena because I think he's responding to your statement when you said Jesus was a stumbling block to the Jews. Oh, yeah, yeah. Richard Arena wrote, uh, Jesus is capital capitalized, never a stumbling block. Well, no, Jesus was a stumbling block. Uh, it says it clearly in scripture that Jesus, they stumbled, talking about the Jews or Israel, they stumbled at that stumbling stone. It's an Old Testament prophecy about Israel rejecting Jesus as the promised Messiah. And it says they, I'm sure you already know this. I, I think I get what your real point was, but just in case somebody else saw it, I'll explain it. It says that Jesus, uh, when that they, the Jews, they stumbled at that stumbling stone. Behold, uh, Zion, I lay before you a rock of offense. Yep. The rock of offense. And so it offended the Jews. He offended the Jews. Yeah. Uh, and so they wanted to keep their Levitical law system and their self-righteousness thinking that the law saved, but it never, never offered eternal life through the law. It was to show us that we are all guilty and need a savior. Um, and so Jesus, when he offered the free gift of eternal life without having to go and make animal sacrifice and no need of Levitical priesthood, they didn't like this. See, as of now, the Levitical priests were the only ones allowed to enter to the Holy of Holies. And they represented the people before God. But when Jesus came, he is the only high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So the Levitical priesthood was no more obsolete. And they didn't like it because power and money came through the priesthood. Yeah. And, when, and you take that away. They stumble at the stumbling stone. Yeah. They like the things the world they got from the world because of their position as Levitical priests, uh, rather than uh, the free gift. Because now everyone, Jesus said, they they will neither worship here nor in Jerusalem, yeah. but they'll worship Him in spirit and truth. And they didn't like that. They don't want everybody. The Catholic Church doesn't like <laughs> that you can come boldly to the throne of grace. Uh, and Jesus is the advocate. No, they need you to have a hierarchy of worldly priests and popes and everything else. They hate that salvation is a free gift and you don't need any man to intervene on your behalf. So it, he was a stumbling stone and still is a stumbling block for the worldly carnal churches that want power. Yep. Yeah. I, uh, um, uh, I, I, he's, yeah, he's still a stumbling block to many people. Uh, but um, there's also the uh, verses in the Bible that say that the cross is a stumbling block. It says, the cross to the Gentiles is foolishness, and to the Jews, it's a stumbling block. So, um, uh, they, they, it's just the fact that people cannot accept that, hey, it was all accomplished. Everything that is required was accomplished on the cross. Everything was finished by Jesus Christ. And, and it's a stumbling block. His finished work of Jesus on that cross is a stumbling block to the world as a whole. They cannot accept that this is so, this grace is so um, fantastic and uh, it's so sufficient. Um, Amen. 
let me see. Uh, there was someone else said something I wanted us to respond to. What was it? Uh, okay. All right. Well, I forgot. So let, let's go on. Let's go back to the KJV and uh, verse uh, uh, 10. Uh, for if any man see thee which has knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And on into verse 11, and through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. Mm. Mm -hmm. Hey, Brother Cripps. Verse 10 and 11. Okay, so if, uh, again, it's the same idea that the person uh, that has knowledge and understands these things that Paul's laying out there about that we have liberty to eat uh, uh, the meat that was formerly uh, sacrificed to idols, which is nothing in the world. We know that, um, uh, as Renee said, yeah, there are demons behind it, but there's no power in the idols themselves. Uh, especially compared to Christ. Uh, there's no power in that, and we can eat whatever we want. So if they see the person with knowledge uh, is eating uh, these meats in the idol's temple, they're literally going to the idol's temple, should not the conscience of him which is weak. So this is the person looking and seeing you eating in the, idol, the idol's temple, eating meat sacrificed to idols. Um, won't that spark them to... Uh, uh, emboldened, and uh, that's the word emboldened, uh, which just means uh, give them courage or or spark them up to the point to eat those things which are offered to the idols, seeing you do that. And then verse 11, and through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish. So they're not understanding it. I mean, when when they see that happen, they're like, what in the world's going on? That That's what, that, that's what their reaction would be. Um, would it, wouldn't it make them perish? And so he's making the point about the stumbling block. And uh, then the last point, I guess, him referring back to Christ, for whom Christ died. He died for the weaker brother. He died for the stronger brother. He died for all of us. So we're all included in that. Hello? You're muted, Brother Luke. Yeah, I was just Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, Renee, I'll, I'll read it in the Amplified 10 and okay. 11 before you respond. All right. For if someone sees you, a person having knowledge, eating in an idol's temple, then if he is weak, will he not be encouraged to eat things sacrificed to idols and violate his own convictions? For through your knowledge, uh, your spiritual maturity, this weak man is ruined. That is, he suffers in his spiritual life, the brother for whom Christ died. Yeah. Yeah. The word perish there is a little, it's, it's, it, the connotation of his heart. It almost seems right. like they're, they're going to hell because, you know what I mean? The but perish though is in the KJV though. So I, right, I, right. I, I so, just so, read the Amplified. I don't want people, we, we, we criticize the Amplified when, when we need to. But I don't want people to think that you're uh, criticizing the Amplified. In no, case, no, no. In this case, it's the KJV that yeah, has the right. way that you're questioning. But we have to see the surrounding scriptures to get the connotation. You know, they're not. It's not wrong to say perish here. It's just the connotation we give it. So we need to make sure the surrounding scriptures are talking about our spiritual life being affected. It's clear here right. that uh, we are uh, we are suffering. So if the person uh, sees you eating freely, but they don't have the knowledge, like you were saying, Luke, that it's not it's not going to make one difference to God either whether you eat it or don't eat it because you're not it's not making you any closer to God or distancing from him if you don't observe it. So there it doesn't make one difference at all in regards to your spiritual relationship with God. But if that man does not know that, he doesn't know he has that freedom, he still, but sees you doing it, he's going to try to do what you do so as not to offend you. Again, this is hospitality. 
Mm-hmm. You don't want to offend people. Uh, and this was a big deal back then. I really want people to understand we're not as like we are today. We're like, well, I'm going to eat what I want. It's more like you know, it was just unheard of for you to offend a house guest or to come into their home and offend them. Right. So this is a matter of isn't he going to feel compelled to do something against his own conscience? Yeah. So because he sees you eat something that he feels condemns when he eats. But he's going to do it to not offend you. Right. And now you've got him committing sin because it's against his own conscience. And whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So now Mm -hmm. he is suffering in his spiritual walk because either one, you didn't let him know, give him the knowledge of that and why you're doing it. Yeah. Uh, Or he is just not walking out his liberty and either way you're compelling him to do something against his own own beliefs and his core system so we don't ever want to do that it's no. you carry the burden he's saying you stronger and freer in the faith you have to carry that burden for your weaker brother it's only right because it doesn't hurt you but it'll hurt him amen yeah uh the uh, uh the footnote in the Amplified for verse 10. Now let's look at that. The the knowledge that no harm can come from eating the meat, since in reality the sacrifice is meaningless. Mm-hmm. It also says, such as the, the position in which people dined, uh, reclining, the word reclining uh, in verse uh, 10. Let me see where it says it. For if someone sees you, a person having knowledge, eating in an idol's temple, when then if he is weak, he will be, uh, I don't see the word reclining there. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll look at it in the NABRE. Uh, no, there's no footnote on it there. Um, all right. Let's go back to the KJV verse 11. Uh, I mean, 12. <clears throat> Uh, but when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Mm. Sister Renee, you get to go first on that one. She's trying to click over, I'm sure. Yeah, I am. I got a couple things yeah. opened up here and I can't maneuver too well. I understand. Yeah, again, he's saying uh, it's I will, I will always rather err on the side of carrying the burden for my brother. Yes. Rather than live out, you know, enforce my freedom upon another because it's it's more important. Let me see how he words it there. Um, hold on one second. When you sin against the brother, so he's reminding them that what that brother does by being weak in the faith is not harming you. But if you insist upon him doing something against his conscience by enforcing your own uh, liberty, now you're sinning not only against him, but you're sinning against Christ himself because you're wounding their conscience. Mm -hmm. You're causing uh, them to have an issue in their spiritual walk. This is, you know, therefore, if meat makes my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth. He's he's making a very extreme, it's like an exaggeration to prove his point. Mm-hmm. You know, if if eating meat would hurt a brother, then I would never eat meat again while the world exists. Right. That's how important it is to him to not harm another brother. Mm-hmm. And he's saying if you're harming another, you're you're sin- sinning against Christ. Because right. we're all one body. Amen. You're muted, Brother Luke. Thanks. I, I'm, I'm muting tonight because I'm turning on my fan sometimes. I didn't want the noise of the fan to interfere. Okay, thanks for telling me. Um, verse 12 in the Amplified. And when you sin against the brothers and sisters in this way and wound their weak conscience by confusing them, you sin against Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they're saying that he's making the point here that, okay, again, you have the knowledge. So this is not an accident. 
Now, it can be an accident if you don't have knowledge and you're doing it in front of someone that's a weaker brother. And, and uh, well, yeah, you're a weaker brother too, but you, you may not have an issue in that area and just, just do it unintentionally. That's different. But if you have the knowledge and you do it, you're singing, sinning against Christ and in the Amplified by confusing them. Um, and that, uh, I think that would be referring to the other, uh, the verse above that which you see the person with liberty eating the meat in the temple, in the very idol's temple. And what a what a uh, crazy thing that would be um, to violate uh, his own convictions or, or leading him, again, as a stumbling block. That's what we're talking about, to violate his own convictions. Um, and then this point, he's making clear that it would be, you're sin sinning against Christ. And who, with knowledge, would do that? Who would who would treat their their weaker brother in that way, uh, especially if they know? And Paul's making it clear that it's sinning against Christ. We wouldn't want to do that. I like what Renee said. Uh, if if you knew that uh, you you had to go the rest of your life on this earth and not eating meat, it's better to do that than it would be to offend someone else in that way, to be a stumbling block to someone else. So it's 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 a pretty serious thing. We want to avoid that at all costs. Yeah, I th I find it very interesting that uh, you got these two groups of people. One does not have the knowledge and understand this uh, spiritual reality that this meat sacrifice to animals animals is irrelevant. It shouldn't you shouldn't let it bother you. It, it has no meaning. Just go ahead and feel free to eat it. But they don't understand that. So in that way. They are not as mature or as knowledgeable uh, in the scriptures and to understand this truth. Right. But then the other person who does understand this, you'd think that they are uh, a more mature uh, Christian. And yet, they, if they have that knowledge and then they go ahead and uh, uh, create, make themselves this uh, a stumbling block for the, uh, the other brother or sister, then then uh, it turns out that it, they don't really have the maturity that you think. They, they have the knowledge of, oh, it's okay to eat it, but they don't have the maturity in terms of understanding how to apply that knowledge. Uh, they, they, they know that it's okay for them to eat it, so, but rather than realizing that it's better for my brother if I abstain, or even if they realize, oh, it, uh, uh, it'd be better for them if I abstain, but I'm not willing to. I'm not going to give up my freedom. Uh, uh, well, are they, are, are they really more mature? They're not really mature, even though they understand they have the freedom. They don't understand that uh, they need to re refrain themselves in this case. All Amen. right. All right. I impressed myself more than anybody else with that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's go to the first 13 in the KJV. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Brother Cripps? Uh, yeah. Um, this is what Renee said. Uh, it, again, if you know that you need to go the rest of your life and not eat meat, then it's better to do that. If it makes your, if, if it's going to be offensive to the brother, don't eat it. You know, it, it, at least while you're in the presence of this person, um, you don't want to offend anyone. You don't want to offend your brother or sister. Um, again, with you having the knowledge and they don't have the knowledge. And if in their conscience, they're deciding for whatever reason, even though they're they're likely wrong, um, then uh, we don't want to do that and offend them. I will eat no flesh while the world standeth. That's what Renee referred to. Of, of not ever eating it, if, if it comes to that. And Paul's making that point very clear. Lest, lest I make my brother to offend, leading him uh, to offense by being a stumbling block. I think that's pretty, pretty clear. Yes, okay. Uh, I'll read verse 13 in the Amplified, Renee. Uh, it says, uh, therefore, if my eating a certain food, pop-up just came up, blocked my view here. Therefore, if my eating a certain food causes my brother to stumble or, or sin, 
I will not eat such meat ever again, so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. Renee? Takes her a second. Yeah, I, I uh, answered that one. What were, did you want me to say more on it? No, not if you're... You, you you realize you jumped ahead, Renee? Yes, you, I did. I jumped to 12 brother, as well. Because I, cause I said, uh, I lumped it all together and said uh, that was Paul making such an extreme yeah. stance yeah. that yeah. he's saying I would rather never eat yeah. meat again if it would cause someone to stumble. I apologize for doing yeah. that. Well, I'm, yeah, well, I don't know. You might, you might need a re real reprimand now. <laughs> Like she doesn't have enough reprimands. <laughs> <laughs> okay, look, uh, I, I'm going to read a footnote, but I just put a word in in here in the chat room. And so, uh, someone, if someone can look up that word and give me a definition, I would appreciate it. And here's the footnote um, uh, in the NABRE, the footnote on verse 13. Um, uh, his own course is clear. He will avoid any action that might harm another Christian. This statement prepares for the paradigmatic development in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I have no idea what paradigmatic means, but that's the footnote. So apparently in chapter 9, we're expecting some paradigmatic development. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, let's go. Uh, let's go ahead chapter 9, but uh, chapter 9, verse 1 in the KJV. <laughs> oh, by the way, did, did, let me look and see if anybody found the definition before we go on. Let me see. Words are two syllables or less. Keep the words to two syllables or less for Hendrix. <laughs> I'm about. Okay. The two syllables. Okay. All right. Uh, so put it in all caps. So get our attention if you're someone's able to look up the word for me. Uh, okay, now let's go back now to the KJV, uh, chapter 9, verse 1. Okay, now uh, obviously, uh, I'm just going by the first verse I'm looking at. Uh, this looks like a, a real place to, be, to, to change it, uh, to do a chapter uh, division, because I think he's moving on to something else entirely now. Okay, so uh, we've talked before about how uh, uh, when the scriptures were written, we did not have uh, notes uh, saying chapter numbers and uh, verse numbers. Uh, I, I'm not really sure. It'd be an interesting study to see who first put the verses and chapter divisions in. I, I did actually look that up recently, but I forgot. Uh, <clears throat> But uh, so we shouldn't put too much, read too much into these these divisions. Some people do, particularly in the KJV. They believe that even the chapters and the verses are profound and and uh, and uh, have this uh, great uh, uh, revelations for us in um, particularly in numerology and the civic significance of certain numbers. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm, I'm not I'm not so sure about all that. But uh, <clears throat> okay, chapter nine, verse one. Paul says, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? Uh, verse 2, if I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you, for the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. Renee, will you go first on verse 1 and 2? Yeah, let me get over to my page there. All right. So, on. Forgive. I, I'm so sorry. I'm slow. It's I, this new computer is not quite as. Uh, yeah. So Paul is claiming that he is. A, we know our liberty in Christ. He said, "Am I not an apostle?" So he's saying, uh, "I speak from a place of authority." Mm -hmm. And he, am I not free? So he's saying, I'm free and I speak from a place of authority. This is his, what is it, prosopopoeia? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are ye not my work in the Lord? So he's saying that uh, I'm the one teaching you. 
I'm responsible for you. I'm not going to lead you in a wrong place. Mm -hmm. If I be not an apostle unto others, doubtless I am to you for the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. So he's saying, if, if my apostleship, because this is another issue, uh, remember where he says, examine yourselves that you be in the faith and says, since you seek proof of Christ speaking in me, mm. uh, he's saying, look to your own selves, prove mm. your own selves, examine yourselves that you be in the faith. And he says that they can confirm him being an apostle, a legit apostle by looking to themselves. And so in a similar fashion, Ooh. he's doing the same thing here. Because he said, if I, hold on, if I be not an apostle unto others, yet outless I am to you. He's saying, if you can't confirm that I'm an apostle to other people, there is no doubt that I am your apostle. Mm. For the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. Because he's saying, I brought you to faith in Christ and you are in the Lord because of my apostleship. So again, he's telling them that they can verify his apostleship by looking to themselves, by examining themselves. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, okay, Brother Cripps, I'll, I'll read it in the Amplified, verse 1 and 2. Am I not free, that is, unrestrained and exempt from any obligation? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus, our risen Lord, in person? Are you not the result and proof of my work in the Lord? If I am not considered an apostle to others, at least I am one to you. For you are the seal and the certificate and the living evidence of my apostleship in the Lord, confirming and authenticating it. Mm. Hey, uh, Brother Luke, real quick, they're still doing this to this day. I just had to do a video defending the Apostle Paul again. So there's people come up behind poor St. Paul and declare him a false prophet, and they're still doing it to this day. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's, uh, uh, before we go into that, let me back up because it looks like people have answered my request for a definition. And uh, Henry, Henry, what's that? I want to comment on this first when you're done also, if you don't mind. Okay, I'll, I'll do this definition for this word first that I asked to def be defined. Um, and it, uh, Hendrix wrote uh, two definitions. One is serving as a typical example of something. Quote, his biography is paradigmatic of the experiences of this generation, unquote. Uh, the second definition is what I think is uh, applies in this case, and it is, of or denoting the relationship between a set of linguistic items that form mutually exclusive choices in a in particular syntactic syntactic roles. Uh, so it's a ling linguistic term uh, items or techniques uh, showing uh, kind of mutually exclusive or like an oxymoron concepts. <clears throat> and of course, we talked before about Paul, particularly in. Uh, our introduction in the first couple of chapters of Romans of him using this uh, oratorical technique of prosopopoeia, where he's presenting the false teacher's point of view and then comparing it to his own point of view. I hope you'll uh, check out the video, the playlist I wrote uh, or did called, um, Was Paul a Diatribalist um, of Prosopopoeia? and also see the first few videos on the book of Romans we did to understand this further. Uh, but that's what this uh, NABRE footnote is, uh, is suspecting, that the, this paradigmatic technique is being used in this chapter. Um, okay, um, Brother Matthias, go ahead and comment on those, two, those verses, please. Verse one and two. Right, it was, um, you know, I get what Paul is saying here. But uh, in my own personal life, I actually dis disagree with this point of view. I have, I actually know people who um, helped me come to the Lord who do not have the same gospel themselves. Uh, so they did show me that the Bible was true in many ways. 
they did show me that uh, um, that they did many works for the Lord and that they directed me in many ways. Um, but when it comes down to it, and, and in fact, these people would actually even say such things to me. Oh, well, you know I'm saved because I help get you saved. I'm like, huh? How do I know that? What? Um, and so I actually, in my own personal life, have come up with somebody using what Paul seems to be saying here, and they didn't have the right gospel when it came down to it. Um, so, yes, they did help... Uh, shake me out of my slumber of not even seeking truth. But when I found the truth, uh, this person or these people, I should say, actually are preaching works. And I, I believe grace. So, um, so I, I get where I get what Paul's saying here, but I myself won't uh, just say, okay, you helped me see these truths. So that must mean you're saved. And I wouldn't do what Paul's doing here either, saying to somebody, well, if you're saved, you know I am. So I'm not saying Paul's wrong. I'm just saying in my own personal life, I've seen it not necessarily work this way, and I wouldn't do it myself. Paul is just confirming that he's sent from God. He's not confirming his own salvation even. So right. even even if your statement, I get what you're saying, but those people were probably sent from God, whether they were saved or not. But there, Paul walks in signs and wonders too. Right. You know, right. he walked in suit. He was given a, an abundance of revelation and spiritual gift. Well, he in order to confirm verse. himself too. Yeah. Well, he says in this verse, "Have I not seen him in person?" Right. You know. So, right. so there's there there is a there's something special here right. between Paul and everything else. I was just stating in my own personal life, I've actually had people say, "Well, you know, trying to." Uh, when we're when we actually get talking about what truly grace is, like, well, you know, I'm saved. I help get you saved. Like, well, that's part of the problem with private interpretation of scripture, too. Ooh, a, you know? very good point. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Okay. Uh, I th I think you make an interesting point, and uh, um, so the the question would be. Um, um, is it uh, Paul is, is is using the fact that uh, since he led them to the Lord that uh, that is a certification as it says here in the uh, Amplified it says confirming and authenticating his apostleship he said for you are the seal and the certificate and living evidence of my apostleship in the Lord confirming and authenticating it um, but Matthias, uh, if I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying that sometimes a person could be a, 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 a real a false uh, believer, but somehow aid you or others into coming to, to faith. And uh, so it's not necessarily uh, proof of, of one's salvation, just the fact that in some way they maybe got you into the Bible or, or uh, you know, uh, we're somehow uh, contributed to your coming to, to your faith. Uh, uh, let's look at the footnote. Uh, Brother Cripps, did I give you a chance to talk about no. this? Okay, go ahead. You talk about verse 1 and 2, please. Well, okay. Um, I, I wanted to, to comment on uh, what Renee said because it was it, it was very clear uh, the, the, the relationship that this verse, uh, these two verses has to the other verses that talk about you'll know them by their fruits and talking about the byproduct of the false prophets. Uh, to hearing the false gospel, uh, you'll know them by their fruits. And talking about the wolves preaching and, and what comes of that, um, by, the, by the teaching you'll see uh, in the disciples of that. So the, the, uh, the contrary is true here with what Paul's saying. Um, you know, Paul makes the point and he's backing it up by saying, I've seen the Lord in person. And then here's the point here. Are you not the result and proof of my work in the Lord? In the same way that when you look at the, at the followers of the false doctrines, it's very, very clear what, who, what kind of fruit they produce. And then back down a couple lines, and it says, for you are the seal and the certificate 
and the living evidence of my apostleship in the Lord confirming and authenticating it. So I'm looking at it in a little bit different way. And Ren Renee was uh, kind of capitalizing on that a little bit when she made her comments and that, that other verse uh, just kind of flew into my head. So in either case, the fruit, the, the, the people that are listening to whatever the teaching are, you can recognize uh, what group they fall into. And I think this is true. You, you can recognize a lordship person from a, a free grace. You can recognize a Calvinist and, and you can recognize by the words that come out of their mouth, the fruit that they're presenting, whether it's rotten fruit or whether it's good fruit. Um, that's the first point. And I just wanted to comment on what Matthias said just really, really quickly. And, and I understand the point that he's making. I don't, I don't think that that's what Paul's saying. He is saying something about saying, I've, you know, I've seen the Lord. I mean, who else has seen the Lord? Uh, Jesus appeared to him. He saw him. Uh, so I, I do think that gives him some credence over, or, over some other, uh, some other people see him in person, anyone that saw him in person, obviously. Um, but, uh, uh, what Matthias is saying is absolutely true. Someone that when you're in the seeking stage, and I think Matthias would agree with this, when you're seeking, uh, someone can come along and uh, teach the truth. I mean, it, it, it's clear that someone that doesn't have the right gospel can still fall into some truth and teach that to someone else and, and essentially uh, lead another to the path. They're not saving you. Uh, but lead you to be saved in Matthias' case that he's making that point. And it's absolutely true. Someone can get saved by T.D. Jakes. I mean, so, someone can get saved by any anyone out, else out there, even if they're not um, preaching the true gospel. I mean, leading them to the point of, of, of belief uh, because they're hitting on some truth. It's the idea of, of uh, eating the meat and spitting out the bone. And um, I, I think that all the teachers out there, we have to we have to do that. But I, I do agree somewhat somewhat with uh, what Matthias was saying. Um, I don't. I'm, I, I kind of agree with Renee on this point, though. I don't see him saying that. He is saying I'm an apostle. Um, I don't see anything about him trying to prove he's saved. He's just, to me, this is just my opinion. He's referring to the idea that um, the people that I teach. You, you know I'm an apostle. Even if people on the outside don't believe it, you know I'm an apostle, uh, apostle and you know what I'm teaching, and you are the proof of that. You're the seal and cert certificate of living evidence uh, of the fact that Paul's an apostle of the Lord, confirming and authenticating it is what the Amplified says. You're muted again, Brother Luke. Mm. Thank you. I'm glad that my video is working well enough. You can see my lips moving. Yeah, I sure can. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I, I think that Matthias, I think your point's valid. If we're talking about uh, someone's salvation, we cannot assume someone's saved uh, based on that. But in this case, uh, the question is not salvation, it's apostleship. And we know that uh, there that historically, and unfortunately, uh, throughout history and even today, the charges against the Apostle Paul uh, have never stopped uh, accusing him of him being a false apostle. And, and part of that is because he was the one that more so than anybody else preached against uh, adding uh, the law to grace. Yep. And um, so people who want to hold on to the law the, and the Jews that wanted to hold on to Judaism and keep that, make that part of, of, of Christianity, uh, they didn't like Paul. Uh, so Paul, he, he, more than once, he has to defend that he is a real apostle. And uh, so that's what this is, the context of this. Am I not an apostle? And he says, or, he says um, uh, if I be not an apostle unto others, so uh, there are others who are arguing that he's not really an apostle. These are the, the thorn in the flesh or the Judaizers that go to Paul's churches and after Paul leaves and say, Paul's a false apostle and uh, you got to also get circumcised and um, so on. But uh, let's look at the footnote in the, in the Amplified. It says um, in verse one, Paul knew that to be an apostle in the same sense as the original 12 apostles, 
uh, in parentheses says, with Matthias replacing Judas Iscariot, uh, he had to be an eyewitness of the resurrected Christ. Mm -hmm. His encounter with Christ on his journey to Damascus met this requirement. Mm -hmm. So I, I have heard before, and uh, maybe it's based upon this. Uh, um, I don't know if there's any other scriptures I can uh, think of offhand that say uh, being an eyewitness is uh, uh, as an essential criteria for being an apostle. Uh, Paul, I think, is making the point here. The reason he's saying that he's an eyewitness, he's seen him in person, the risen Lord, uh, is that that's part of a qualification for being an apostle. Now, we also should understand that the word apostle has a broader meaning rather than just, let's say, you one of the apostles. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm really being, uh, it's correct for me to say, make a distinction between the apostles and an apostle. Because the word apostle means as someone who's sent by God on some kind of a mission or, or, or a, um, a, a purpose, a, a called for some purpose. That, that person could be called an apostle in that sense. Someone who I think Rene used it that way, that he was sent by God. But, it, yep. but people who are sent on missions and God's calling people, it, 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 an, it is an accepted use of the word to call them an apostle. Um, all right. Uh, before Brother I go, Luke, in, yes. I, I, I wanted to add to what they just said in the footnote, if you don't mind, real quick. Yeah, please do. Uh, Paul did not replace Judas as the twelfth apostle. Uh, Matthias, I think his name was Matthias, wasn't it? The one yeah. that they chose by lots. Yeah. And Paul was sent to the Gentiles. So, <clears throat> one a Jew, although he was a Jew, I think Matthias replaced. Uh, as much as we love our Matthias, not that Matthias, but the one in the Bible, I think, was that his name? I think it was. Uh, <clears throat> they cast lots for him. So uh, I often wondered, hey, since he was the greatest apostle in the New Testament, is he going to be one of the names written on the 12 foundations? And I just can't know that because I believe he was not sent to the, his, he was clearly sent to the Gentiles. So it probably won't be his name on the foundations to represent the 12 tribes. It'll probably you know be what Matthias. I mean? Yeah, Matthias. So yeah. I just wanted to remind people that he's not the one that replaced one of the original 12. He was sent to a completely different mission, and that's why he calls it my gospel, not because the gospel's different, but because his core audience to whom he was sent was different. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I see it differently with, with Paul and Matthias in this whole issue. Um, um, I don't see any indication where the apostles had the authority or the instructed by God to draw lots to replace Judas. I think that is something that they took upon themselves. And uh, uh, Matthias is never mentioned again. Of course, other apostles are never mentioned right. too, but um, um, uh, I do believe that Paul was selected to to be the replacement. I believe he's the one that's going to be one of the twelve on the the gates or the Could be. whatever it is. Uh, and regarding um, um, the distinction of him being the apostle of the Gentiles, he never quit preaching to Jews and Gentiles. That's true. Uh, so uh, it says that it was his custom. Every city he went to, he first went to the synagogue. And then after they, he went through the scriptures proving Jesus was the promised Messiah, uh, and they would always reject him. Maybe a few would believe. But um, uh, he still continued preaching to the Jews. And, and But, of course, we know that he is designated by Jesus himself to be uh, the apostle for the Gentiles. And on the other hand... Oh, sorry. Right. And, and, and even the other apostles eventually, now I had someone argue with me about this recently, but um, in, in the historical records, when we look at the death of all of the apostles, um, uh, you can see that they, are, they died, in, many of them in foreign countries, uh, uh, preaching to Gentile world. And so, um, and they say, well, that's Fox's Book of Martyrs, or that's extra biblical, and that's not true. They all, none of them left Jerusalem. Well, Obviously, look at Peter. He went to he was went to Rome, and so I, I believe that all the apostles preached to Jews and Gentiles, and Paul preached to Jews and Gentiles. 
but Paul did have this distinction and uh, we can't argue with that. But I, uh, I, I'm, I'm a little bit sensitive to that because I, I, I'm, I'm probably the only one, I feel totally alone in this cause, and, and, and except our brother um, um, uh, David Benjamin in Christ, uh, he's he's made some some videos against hyper dispensationalism, what I call Paul onlyism, but I don't know anybody else who's making videos against Paul onlyism, and I have a playlist against it, and I'm particularly sensitive because my first couple of years on YouTube, my closest friends were Paul onlyists until I decided to you know express my disagreement with it, their conclusions. And then I lost all those friends. And ever since then, I've, I've felt the need for, to me to show the air of Paul onlyism. Um, so I'm, that's why I'm always, uh, when it comes to Paul and his role, to make sure everybody understands that uh, he's the apostle of Gentiles, but he's still, like all the apostles, preached to Jews and Gentiles. Yeah, he also uh, said to the Jew first and then also to the Greek. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I, I hope I'm clear in saying I'm not belittling Paul's role here. I just wanted to point out that they had done something to replace Judas uh, so that Matthias was considered that 12th one. But you know what I was thinking? We could actually look at the uh, tribes that each apostle came from. And if there isn't one for Benjamin, that might be Paul, you know? If he's yeah. the only one from the tribe of Benjamin, maybe so. Maybe yeah. he is the one representing that tribe because there one there's one for each twelve tribes. Yeah. Uh, now you know that uh, the the Paul only us uh, they elevate Paul even above Jesus. Now that might shock everybody, because but uh, it is a fact. If you watch my playlist, I think you'll have to come to that conclusion. Oh yeah, they, they said they throw all of what Jesus said out. That's to the Jews. Yeah, you yeah. can't get saved by yeah, the gospel. Yeah. They say you can't get saved by the gospels? Yes. Yeah, you, you can't get saved oh. by anything except Paul's writing and uh, the even the red letters, the words of Jesus himself, you can't get saved. So they're elevating above all uh, Peter and John and Jesus himself. And so that's why I'm so sensitive to this. Sure. But I, I do elevate Paul I also in the sense that uh, I – John, Peter, and Jesus all taught that we're saved by faith in, in, in right. Jesus in, in the cross. But Paul took it one step further and saying, right. and not only are you saved by believing in Jesus, but if you dare to add religion to it, you've ruined it. This is the right. distinction, the contribution that he made is making that clarification. Yep. So I, I do appreciate Paul. I think um, I think that uh, he is the, the replacement. But but you study those scriptures out, maybe you can, I'm, I'm speculating, I can't prove it, but I don't see anything in the scriptures that gives me confidence that what the, the apostles did drawing lots was, was what God intended. Well, I, I, would, I would love to make a point whenever, whenever it's uh, convenient. Oh, there, we ran out of time. Good night. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Um, so I would agree with you, Brother Luke, actually, about that, about the drawing lots uh, wasn't, it didn't uh, fall in line with um, uh, what a candidate needs to be an apostle. And I want to make this point because uh, today so many people are attaching that to themselves, apostle so-and-so, apostle uh. so-and-so, and it irritates me. I'll just be honest, it irritates me. It gets under my skin because there are no present-day apostles. There aren't. They're just aren't. So you can't just put a name on yourself and say, oh, I'm an apostle. You can't. So so the requirements can be found in Acts 1, chapter 1, 21 through 26. And the first requirement, the candidate was required to be someone who followed Jesus during the in his entire earthly ministry, beginning from Jesus' baptism by John to Jesus' ascension in, into heaven. So you see that being the 12, excluding Judas. Obviously, we know what happened to him. So there are 11 uh, apostles, 11 disciples that were that fall into that category. Number two, the candidate was required to have seen Jesus after his resurrection, and that can be found in, in uh, chapter 1, verse 22. And then third, the candidate needed to have been appointed by the Lord Jesus himself. So in, in this case, there's no there's no present-day apostles, there's no one alive that, ha that fits in this category at all. 
So I don't, I don't trust anyone that, that attaches that name to themselves. I don't look at them or consider them an apostle at all. So this would say, Brother Luke, getting to the, the final point then, the, the drawing of the lots, I'm not saying it was sin, but it doesn't fall into the same requirements in Acts. Uh, so it would have been 11, if my number's correct, it would have been 11 apostles and then add Paul to it, uh, but maybe not Matthias and, and uh, uh, the other one. Um, I, I think the speculation, though, to say that that wasn't okay with God. Right? No, no, because, I'm not saying that. Yeah, you it know is, what I mean? Because right. if if he fought, obviously he met all the, the other one we have any speculation yeah. on to question is whether yeah. the Lord chose him to be sent let, let, out. Let me, let me uh, you're right. Right. It's and I'm not it. doing that. Just just to be clear before while I have a chance. I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'm just saying, uh, based on the requirements. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you laid those out. Okay. Let me, uh, uh, let me speculate. I, I, what, my conclusion is speculation, but this is the primary reason I've come to the conclusion is that I don't see this. Jesus drew lots to get his right. original 12. Jesus right. just selected them personally. Mm -hmm. And Jesus did not select Matthias. He did select Paul. Yeah. So I believe that was what what I think that the uh, the apostles jumped the gun. They decided to take it into their own hands instead of yeah. waiting for God awesome. to pick a replacement. Yeah. That's my conclusion. But I I'm yeah. not it saying felt, that. It felt anymore. weird to me too. To be honest, it did. It felt weird to me that they would do that because I'm taken to the uh, soldiers who cast lots for his vesture. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, and, and I good. thought that's kind of a divination type thing, and that was bizarre to me. So I'm not agreeing or disagreeing. Right. I'm just saying I'd be interested in seeing whether Paul is considered mm -hmm. one of the 12 tribes. That's the, the 12. Mm -hmm. um, he sure deserves it for as much as he contributed and, and all that he did. Um, but I would like to see if we can find out enough info on the 12 apostles to find out if one from each of the 12 tribes is present. And if the only one missing is Benjamin, we can have that question answered now. Yeah. You know what I mean? I I, I uh, doubt that very much, especially when you have brothers. That's true. I forgot about that. Zebedee, sons of Zebedee. You're right yeah. about that. Uh, and, uh, um, Peter, Peter and uh, 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 Andrew, Andrew and John and James are were yep. our brothers. So you can't have 12 tribes if you have two brothers. That's true. Uh, so it won't be literally broken that down. Be, that would not be the deciding factor. Um, That's but true. I, I am speculating, but at least you know why I've come to that conclusion. I'm not, I'm not decreeing it like an absolute. And, no. uh, but I believe I'm pretty confident that Paul was the, the one that was chosen to be the replacement. There you go. That's why we talk about this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, we're time's out, but let me read a, the footnote here on uh, the chat. I'm sorry to interrupt. I think Matthias wanted to add something. If you want to let him give him the time. Sure. Go ahead, Matthias. Well, I was, I, no, I appreciate it. I was just saying that uh, um, the requirements that Jason pointed out, I thought were, and those are the same that, that I came to, that yeah. it had to be somebody who basically was from the beginning to the end of Jesus's ministry. Yeah, uh, and have been there, and I think Justice and Matthias both did qualify. Okay, under those. and that's that. I think that's what it says in Acts. It says it has to be this, and yeah. so it's it's b both of these qualify in that. So we can't yeah, make the decision. That's the, uh, that's the statement from the the eleven. Correct. That was what they, how they de determined it. Right. Was that God's? What was that God's ruling, or was that them acting on their own? Is the question well, c correct? But no, no. The the qualifications I think were were actual, but them acting on it or not, that would be up for speculation. I think, and mm -hmm. I agree, but. I do think the casting of lots is actually quite biblical. We all have our own lot in life. And we all, like, the, the casting of lots, I don't think of it as divination, especially with how much I read the Old Testament and how much godly people did it. Okay. 
that that's why that's why they decided to cast lots because it is biblical it was done routinely to make decisions oh. for things however it was not jesus's method for choosing his apostles no no he didn't need that he didn't need to cast lots yeah no i i agree but but if you look at it as like when Jesus went up to the apostles and said, come and follow me, that actually was their lot in life. Ooh. Yeah, and he also didn't say, he said, I'm gone to my father and you see me no more. So they, I guess they, that's the only way they knew of, of picking someone from the group. Remember the casting of lots on the scapegoat? That's right. That's right. right. There's a bunch. But when you cast lots, you're basically saying you're taking it out of your hands and saying, God, it's you. Mm. Okay, fair enough. I, I'm I don't know enough about the process. I just knew the Roman soldiers did it. Need to find a crap uh, table. And uh <laughs> it's 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 spoken of I, dozens of times in old recorded in the old testament. Yeah. And in major okay. points too, you know. Okay. Cool. I didn't know that. I, I why would they, they don't just randomly dream up on an idea. Hey, why don't we pick lots? No, they did it. <laughs> yeah. it, it was routinely done. Yeah. So you're right about that. But I just, but I don't see Jesus um, using that method to replace Matthias. But I don't want to go on about that. Let's, a uh, little bit of time we have left. Let's, uh, let me read the footnotes here on this chapter uh, from the NABRE. So I think it gives a good overview for everybody. So, that, so looking forward to next week. So uh, it says, uh, verse 1 through 27, this chapter is an emotionally charged expansion of Paul's appeal to his own example. Uh, its purpose is to reinforce the exhortation of 1 Corinthians 8 9. The two opening questions introduce the themes of Paul's freedom and his apostleship, themes that the chapter will develop in reverse order. Uh, treating the question of his apostleship and the rights that flow from it and uh, exploring dialectically the f nature of Paul's freedom. The language is highly rhetorical, abounding in questions, word plays, paradoxes, images, and appeals to authority and experience. The argument is unified by repetitions. Its articulations are highlighted by inclusions and transitional verses. So I'm looking forward to this chapter. All right. Um, all right. Uh, so uh, as as many many other things apart from these three core doctrines, uh, I think everybody we should uh, present everybody's uh, uh, ideas uh, for the congregation as a whole to consider. So sure. just consider it all. Uh, we're not dogmatic about uh, uh, what we were talking about in terms of the lot drawing lots or Paul or anything. No, I'm, yeah, and I want to say I don't have an opinion. I'm feeling yeah, Paul, it out because I don't know. I'm we're absolutely I'm in, in the agreement that Paul is a legitimate apostle. Uh huh. And my favorite. But there's no apostles today. No, gosh, did you see that movie, The Apostle? Yeah, like yeah. A Pentecostal. It's always Pentecostals. Don't you know that the Mormons have twelve apostles? Oh yeah, no, super fine. The Jehovah's Witnesses have super fine apostles. That's what uh, Michael says. They're called super fine apostles. Yeah, they can have them all they want. Uh, all right, I'm trying to respect your time. I know uh, Hendrix and, and Renee uh, need to quit around eleven your time. So, uh, anything you want to say uh, to the chat room? I don't see any uh, questions oh. or capitalizations yeah, that we need to address yeah just that we don't usually deal with big general theological questions on bible study night i explained that to one of them and said how come my questions aren't being answered well we try to stick to questions or surrounding this the study but if you i told him to email you with general theological questions so that we can have an in-depth discussion of them on sundays because it's too hard to try to fit all that in with questions and the study because this is mostly just the study of these verse by verse uh chapters well yeah so. and and i would just add the other issue is that you answered the question in the chat and also we're we're talking about the very answer to the gentleman's question in the study so right if, right if, if the person is listening to what's being talked about, then there's no need for the question because the question's being answered. 
Yeah, okay. it's it's hard for for me to pay attention to. I don't get to read the chat the whole time. Yeah, I'm yeah. No, no, to, you yeah. explained it, Renee. I'm saying yeah. that you answered okay. the question in the chat. So yeah. not only did they have the exposition of the study itself, but you you took the time to answer the question in the chat. And so in general, next time you know, like if you have a basic general question, it. it Unless it's you know urgent, maybe we can get it uh, sent over to Sin City Preacher as an email so that we can you know discuss it better there. Because I really like the time being spent. Like this was an issue I never really discussed with anybody before, and I like hearing both sides of it because I I don't have an opinion really yeah. either way. I'm trying to uh, weigh out what's being said and what the evidence is. I don't lean either direction really. I mean, I, at the beginning, I kind of thought, well, maybe he didn't replace him. Maybe he's just to the Gentiles. Maybe he's not considered, you know, I mean, I, I don't mean he just preached to Gentiles. Of course, he preached to Jews, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, so uh, uh, I like hearing that. And I would like to have that time to discuss these things as they come up along with our scripture reading. Mm -hmm. you know, I like going over this stuff. Uh, Renee, is that your summary? Yeah, I, I, well, yeah, I like. Also, I just wanted to add, uh, once again, anytime somebody of God is attacked over and over again as a false prophet, uh, you can guarantee what he's saying is important because the enemy wants to shut down uh, grace. And Paul, surely, as Brother Luke said, he took it one step further. He didn't preach a different gospel from Jesus and James and anybody else. There's only one gospel from Genesis to Revelation, and it's all God's grace through faith in what Jesus did for us. But he took it one step further and clarified it. And not only is it free, but you can't add works to it because then you negate the gift. So uh, if, if somebody in scripture is an apostle and the world uh, from the time they preach to now are still being called a false prophet, then you better listen to what they got to say, because because Satan's really coming up against them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I can Mike G L McGregor. Uh, do you think apostles will come back before Jesus comes back? Uh, I, I think we can all answer that with one word. No. Don't even worry about that. That's impossible. Oh uh, wait a minute. Yeah, they do the the hundred forty four thousand. They're not apostles. They're no. sent, but they're not apostles in the in the sense that they walk with Jesus. He says, "You think apostles will come back?" No. Oh, oh, you mean the apostles? Yeah. Oh, I thought he meant is there going to be anybody sent by God to preach again? Man. Oh, I never That'd heard. Be funny. There'll be plenty of people preaching, preaching the gospel. You're right, Renee. 144,000 plus the messengers, the two witnesses, the yeah. witnesses. That if you believe it's two people, that's fine. Uh, some people believe it's a group of people all doing yeah. the same thing. That's possible too. But um, biblically speaking, there's not any. The term apostle isn't affixed to anyone in the end times. It's just ah, okay. okay. All right, Brother Cripps, you want to give us a summary? Yeah, absolutely. So this was a kind of deja vu for me with all the dietary laws and stuff. But obviously, as, as I've said many times, I do love that Paul does this. He hits on the topic over and over and over again. It's like Renee on her videos, uh, trying to get people to understand that they're not under works, but they're under grace. Grace, 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 over and over and over again. Because it, it he knew that it was a problem back then and still a problem today. So these dietary verses and meat offered to idols and all that uh, uh, in the first part, making the point that, hey, let's not be stumbling blocks to other people. If we have liberty and someone else doesn't have knowledge, if they're a weaker brother or sister and they're uh, clinging on to these dietary laws, don't don't eat a, a, a don't eat a ham sandwich in front of them. Just let, let's just let's just um, exercise our liberty in a better way and be the stronger brother and not cause uh, anyone to stumble over um, our uh, liberty. And that that's good advice. And then the second part we got as far as talking about the uh, the apostleship of uh, Paul. That was a very interesting conversation to me and. Um, I loved I loved uh, talking about that, but uh, the bottom line is another uh, edifying uh, Bible study, and I hope it was beneficial to those in the chat. I'll say goodbye to the chat.
Uh, love you guys, and uh, thanks for letting me be on again. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, all right, then. Uh, uh, Matthias, uh, you, you had a couple of uh, comments tonight. Uh, would you like to give a summary also? Oh, well, just as normal, I very edified and uh, enjoyed the conversation. Uh, the Wednesday nights, almost, I almost look forward to Wednesday night as much as I do Sunday. Nice. Well, yeah. that's, that's high praise. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, um, uh, no, Mike, no, Jesus is not sending ministers or, or apostles or anything. Uh, he's not sending anybody. If you think send means uh, sending them they, from the past, resurrecting the people from the old time, uh, um, no, but obviously he's using us. I'm a minister. Renee's a minister. Matthias is a minister. Cripps, are you a minister? I am a minister. I'm not an apostle. Yeah, we're ministers. Uh, anybody who's a Christian is a minister. Minister means a servant. So uh, Jesus doesn't have to send ministers. Everybody who's born again is a minister. It's just the question is how how much work are you putting into your ministry? That's the question. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so uh, I, I guess I have nothing to summarize except that I uh, I am especially looking forward to their uh, chapter nine now after getting that overview of it. Amen. So uh, thank you, uh, chat room. Thank you, congregation, for being here. I look forward to uh, next Wednesday. And don't forget to uh, join us this coming Friday again for the Fellowship Friday. That's 9.30 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you, everybody. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.